In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So for the past uh, two days, John Hill, uh, Trent Morris, and myself were attending the uh, semi-annual Synod of the Diocese of Toronto, which is a gathering of approximately 700, 800 people uh, that are representatives uh, from all the churches in the diocese, plus some other organizations, of, plus the bishops, plus all kinds of other people, invited guests, <coughs> dignitaries from other denominations, all kinds of people. And we gather at a hotel uh, that has a conference center big enough to accommodate everyone in one room. And we hear speeches and we worship together and we do all kinds of things like that. Well, this year, one of the things they decided to do differently was to use an electronic voting system so that they could tally the votes by computer very quickly, so that they could move through the parliamentary procedures and motions as quickly and efficiently as possible. So the first question they decided to give us to test the system was this, moved by Bishop Poole that the Synod of the Diocese of Toronto be adjourned immediately. <laughs> and of course it was a joke. But, you know, they, we voted anyway, and 70% of the people voted to adjourn synod right then and there, <laughs> within the first five minutes, which said something interesting about the resistance that people have to the kind of parliamentary, bureaucratic kind of business of giving up your Friday and Saturday to join with 700 or 800 other Anglicans and others to pray, worship, and hear about the vision of the church and, and, and so on. But, you know, something really interesting happened over the course of the next day and a half. A lot of people, I think, if they had a chance to take that vote again, would have changed their vote. One of those such people would be Trent Morris. Uh, you know, Trent, our representative from, the, from our parish, uh, told me afterwards, he said that he actually went as a cynic. Uh, he really thought he was going just because it was something that had to be done. You know? We had to make an appearance, we had to show that we were playing ball with the diocese and all this sort of stuff. And it, it turns out that he was quite impressed, even inspired. He actually said to me, he said, you know, he said, it's, it's too bad Brendan Caldwell uh, wasn't here because Brendan would have been, you know, just clapping his hands. He would have been so impressed. And uh, I said, yes. And in fact, I thought of all the members of our congregation who would have been thrilled by what they heard said and what they saw uh, being done in the Diocese of Toronto. Trent said it was the best advertisement he could have imagined for the diocese. Because all day long, and all night long even, uh, people were talking about what God is doing. They were talking about mission, and they were talking about Jesus. Right here I have a copy of the Archbishop's Charge to Synod, and I just want to read you a couple of, of paragraphs from it. And by the way, it is uh, online both in text and video, and I was the one who helped with the video, uh, if you want to see it. Being missional is not the flavor of the day. It is not a program. It's not a quick fix. It's not about getting more people into our pews. It's an attitude. It's a way of being. It's a response in faith to the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ, who is alive and present with us today through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mission is rooted in the very nature of God, the God who reaches out and creates the God who enters into relationship of love with God's creatures, and the God who reveals the divine life and purposes to us, and Jesus' birth, way of life, his friendships and actions and teachings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, his ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. God in Christ draws us as church and the whole creation to himself in compassion, reconciliation, and redemption, Mission is an orientation of our lives to turn and face outward into the world, to find where God is already active and join in. Skipping ahead. But if you and I are not speaking about the Jesus that you know, where will people hear about him and from whom? And is that message the one that you want them to hear about Jesus? Is that message that's true to Jesus that you know as a faithful Anglican, an Anglican who has been formed by an encounter with Christ, speaking through the scriptures as we wrestle with them and try to intelligently understand them. As we are shaped by the encounter with the life-giving Christ in the sacraments, in our worship, as we engage in loving service where Christ is encountered in the face of the neighbor. So we need to learn to how to talk about faith, to articulate the hope that lies within us. That is the starting place of all missional activity. Don't be afraid, said the Archbishop. God has given us all the gifts we need. 
We have extraordinarily gifted clergy. We have extraordinarily gifted lay people. We have extraordinary resources. We have well-trained teachers of the faith, both clergy and lay. We can engage in reaffirming and reimagining our church, both in what we've traditionally been very good at and also in trying out some new things. You have permission to try out new things. Drive the car. For God's sake, drive the car. Drive the car, for God's sake, said the Archbishop. We are not alone in this. You are not alone in this. Your parish likely has resources within it that are as yet untapped. Your partners with neighboring par parishes can offer opportunities to teach and enrich each other. And he goes on to give some specific examples of cooperation between parishes to resource mission. And then mission is about transformation. We are called in imitation of Jesus and in obedience to Christ to be agents of hope and reconciliation. Hope, not optimism. Hope that people will, hope not that people will avoid change. Hope not that we will avoid pain and loss, but enduring hope, courageous hope, imaginative hope, hope born out of the lived experience of faithful Christians over millennia, that pain, loss, and death are not the last words in God's reign. Hope that is rooted in deep trust in God, whose mission we join in. God, who is revealed in the person of Jesus. That's why it's important to name our faith. Our mission is grounded in hope that Jesus' birth and time, his life and witness and friendship, his witness to God's mission, his death and resurrection, make a difference in our world. That God's mission is Christ transforming individual lives, communities, and the world. And we bear witness to that in word and deed by what we do in, the name, in his name as individuals, as a church, and in synod today and every day. And he goes on to pray. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this synod was more inspiring than any synod or a convention of the church that I have attended. And, and, and I've been attending conventions since I was a little kid and would go with my mom because she was a leader in the church. Uh, you know, I've attended many of these things, and I have to say, this was by far the most inspiring and the one that most made me want to say, yes, right on, because it was all about mission, mission, Jesus, mission, <laughs> basically, and Holy Spirit, mission, Father, mission. It was fantastic. Afterwards, some of my colleagues and I, who have been working very hard behind the scenes to enable churches to get more focused on Jesus' mission, uh, as we've been working on that work for years, laboring in back corners and committees and all kinds of things, we were ecstatic with how the Agenda Committee had shaped the entire convention around this issue of mission. For example, uh, breaking in between the, the periods of the different speakers, we had something else that we called missional moments that occurred, where people gave testimony to specific projects that they were doing around the diocese. One of my personal favorites was this guy, Ted McCollum, who uh, has a church in a, in a fairly rural part of the diocese, very rural. As he says, if you just looked at a big map and you looked for a space in which there were no names <laughs> and then put your finger down there, you might come close to where he is. And in his small Anglican parish, they looked around and they saw these men who were, who were uh, in town who were hanging around who were obviously strangers and looked a little awkward or uncomfortable. And he looked into it and he found out that they were Spanish-speaking migrant workers who were there for a short time to work in the fields and the agriculture that happened in his community. So he began to see what kind of needs they might have. And the, one of the first things that he did was, uh, in this process was uh, he ha found somebody who could speak Spanish, they could talk to these people, and he uh, asked this person uh, who spoke Spanish to translate a list of possible projects that they might want to do with these folks. And they were, you know, things like run some ESL classes and all these things. And so they had this list, and they met with some of these men, and they gave them this list, and they said, is there anything on this list that you think would be helpful for you? And the men kind of like demurred a little bit. And then it occurred to Father Ted that, you know, that was really the wrong approach entirely, that he should simply do the startling thing of asking them, what do you need? <laughs> what do you want from us as church? And they began to articulate something. And one of the first things they said they wanted was a mass, because these men didn't have anywhere to receive the sacrament of communion. That was very important to them. They had had that opportunity back in Mexico, and they missed it here. So he found a Spanish-speaking Anglican priest to come and do a mass. And 
uh, during the, the sermon, uh, which was done in Spanish, he picked out a few words that he could recognize, and, and one of them was semana, like week. And then he realized that it was proxima semana. And then he realized that this guy was committing his church to doing this every week. And that was a bit scary, but they figured it out. They figured it out as a community. And this project, it, it grew and it grew and it grew to the point that uh, after these men moved back to Mexico, uh, back to their families with the money that they had earned in Canada that they used to send their kids to school and to have a better life, uh, they actually invited the church to go to Mexico to visit their villages, to worship in their church, to see what they do. And so Father Ted, his family, and some other people from the church went down to Mexico. And he said he was actually astonished and even perhaps put to shame a little bit by the, the level of hospitality he experienced in Mexico because, again, they were in a rural place, and he thought he was rural in Ontario. This was a whole different thing. Not only that, but as generous as his people and his church were with what resources they had, the amount of generosity he experienced in Mexico out of their poverty was extraordinary. And what he experienced was nothing less than the love of God. Nothing less than the person of Jesus and the person of these people that he was with ministering. That's the kind of story that the diocese has decided to lift up and put in front of us and say, be like this, do this. Images of love, images of service, of compassion, Images of the passionate engagement with people's needs and desires to know a God that loves them. At the end of the day, what we point to is a hope. And that's today's theme. It's easy to look at passages like the one we have today and to, to think they're talking about some kind of crazy apocalyptic end time when everything goes topsy-turvy and Jesus the stern judge comes back. And maybe there is something to that. I don't want to totally dismiss that, but... There's also something about how that moment of apocalypse happens in all our lives, all the time, when we open them and we're awake and alert to the surprising ways that God is active. God is so surprising that he can bring grace even through a synod parliamentary meeting. God is so surprising that even in a discussion about the budget, he can bring up notions of how we can be of service, how we can proclaim Jesus, better as a community of people when we resource together and pool our, our funds together to do God's mission. So us, as a church, are challenged to respond to this. We're challenged to give a gospel of hope to the community that we find ourselves in. How are we doing that? Well, as I have talked about for, I don't know, six years or so, we are trying to form this church for mission, to equip it for mission, and to point in the direction of the hope that Jesus gives us. So we've been working on that and working on that. And uh, one of the things that we've done is, is something called missional listening, where we've listened to our context, to our environment, to the people around us in our neighborhood, to find out what it is that they want. What, for God's sake, do you need from us, neighborhood? It was interesting. Trent uh, attended a workshop that was about missional listening. And uh, you know, Trent, do you mind just sharing like, what your, your reflection on that was? I and yes, I didn't have to try that. John and I split up uh, for the, this breakout session so we could get the maximum benefit. And I attended one called Mission in Context. And, um, and I learned a few things that I'll, I'll share later in the talk. Yeah, but I think the big thing that came out of it was of the approximately 10 things that were listed that the church could do. If you think of it as sort of getting ready for your big excursion, your vacation, or your camping trip, we have already done most of them. Uh, the last one was, you know, and I've been as treasurer of the, <coughs> of the embryonics uh, research because it, it's expensive, as they said yesterday. But they they said it was the last thing they said, and if you can possibly manage to do this, although it's very expensive, and most of you won't be able to. Do it because we were called to get ready um, and then listen carefully. And uh, like last I'll just repeat what I said to the, the youth group upstairs who I asked to come down to hear they preach. Just what, what they said. Just as Jesus did, um, it, when Jesus was asked to perform miracles, um, he didn't respond first by saying, That's not what you need. 
He gave the people what they asked for. And in doing that, they, their faith was strengthened. We know most of them that day. But the, the thing that sort of resonated with me the most, and I'll turn it back to the table, was um, it was put to us that um, we don't need to be dragging people back here. I think the Bishop of Edmonton, Jane, explained it as that those people never really were here to begin with, potentially. We have to meet them where they are. And just as the God incarnate is working in us here, but is also working in those people out there, and we can become closer to God by, in addition to being with God, working alongside God out in the community where those people are. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that, that Trent made an observation about uh, when we were talking about this in the car ride home and so on, was he said that um, it seemed as though we're way ahead of most parishes in the diocese. And it's like, yes, exactly. We're about six years ahead of a lot of parishes, in the, most parishes in the diocese. In terms of the work that we've been doing, in terms of the, 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 all the sort of stuff that we've been doing, all the groundwork that we've laid, not just with the research that we've done and the studies we've commissioned or anything like that, but in the discussions that we've had here every Sunday for six years. Even this very format of worship is designed around mission and trying to empower people to do mission and God's work in the world. We have been thinking about this and planning for this moment for six years. Last week, we had a, a meeting of the parish council with uh, Bishop Yu. And as part of that, we presented him with a vision of the three kind of big projects that we're currently working on and engaged with. And if you want to see that presentation, it's available online at the, at the parish's website. Um, and, and one of the things that was interesting was, was there was a bit of a, a deer in the headlights kind of thing look on the bishop's face at the end because I think we kind of overwhelmed him. I don't think he had any idea, honestly, that we had done that much work and that there was sort of that much to talk about in terms of what we're doing. And he was actually pretty positive about it. And, and when I saw him at Synod, in fact, he said, I, I think these are steps in, in, the, in the right direction. And anyone who knows Bishop Yu knows that's a very encouraging thing for, for him to, to say. <laughs> John's laughing. Um, and indeed, it is encouraging. We are on the right direction. And you know what? Everybody sees that. When I share this, what we're doing with other people, especially the church planter types that I hang out with, the people that are doing cutting-edge ministry, they all see that we are making the right moves. Yeah, there'll be tweaks here and there, but the point is looking outward to how we do mission to these people who are here on the other side of these stone walls, that work that we're doing is the right track, is the right track. And so as we continue in the months and years ahead, be passionate. Hold on to this Jesus hope that you have. Articulate it. Learn a language. Speak it. Learn new ways of talking about the good things that God is doing in your life. And, and for God's sake, share it. For God's sake, literally, share it. Now I'm going to open this up and get some uh, reflections and stuff from the rest of you.